giving us the robe of righteousness, the white robe, washed clean, greater than any bleach could make us in the crimson blood of Christ to serve God and His Father as sanctified saints to Him. Be all glory, honor, and dominion. This is most certainly true. So we live in His grace. The fruits of faith are produced because we are justified by His blood. That was fit. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Sainthood is also a gift. So are all things. A justification before God and our sanctification are being set apart for him because it follows our righteousness in him now declared ours by his blood. It's All Saints Day, observed. We could talk about the distinction between sinner and saint. We could talk about how we are both 100%. Well, hang on a minute, Pastor. How can we be two very different things and also at the same rate? be the same? How can we be different and the same? How can saint and sinner be distinct and yet we be both? Because they are not on equal footing in terms of being a description of what we have done. The difference between saint and sinner is not the good things I do and the bad things I do or think or say. The difference is who I am, is who I have been since the corruption of creation, the fall of man, and its impact upon my heart and mind and very being, because of which I must turn to another to be saved, turn to one that is outside of me. Who does, by the grace of God, promise to affect me internally, yes. To which I may, however much I unlike the phrase, may be given a small internal voice, which now, by a purified conscience, can better tell me, according to God's word, the difference between what is right and wrong. But to be absolutely clear, being defined as a saint is now Christ saying that his righteousness is now mine. That God the Father does not look at my sin and the fact that I am a sinner and thereby judges me any more by my sin. Though he has every right to because that nature still clings to me in this fallen creation. But that now he looks at me through the lens of his son the cross on which his son died and sees his righteousness on me. His robe I now wear. The whiteness and purity and bleachness now mine. Because of the unblemished lamb, the perfect Sacrifice. So far the distinction between saint and sinner, of which I am both. But when it counts, God sees me, his saint. Not just when I pass away, oh there's that saint, Pastor Nauman. But sainted now, as I will be, so I am, by declaration, by promise. That to which I cling, every one of us, as the Father sees us 
so shall we be, so shall he perfect our bodies to reflect that declaration in the resurrection of the dead. And so those who die in Christ die well. The language of baptism is the next point I want to go to, which is reflected all over the place, which I've already talked about. Those cleansing waters. As verse 14 of our first lesson from Revelation 7 reveals again, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Not my doing. Though my parents, by the grace of God, knew to bring me, to wash me, but it wasn't my parents who washed me, it was my parents who brought me to Christ's washing waters. Hence the language, washed yourselves. Though in no context is the person being washed the one washing themselves. Though it is within a Christian household where one is brought up with the tradition and passing down of this particular means of grace whereby one is washed and whereby we wash ourselves. Because the responsibility and privilege of the rite of baptism being handed down from generation to generation by God and those he has given to found the church in Christ we wash ourselves and come December we shall be washing a new addition to our family in Christ we look forward to that with great anticipation. I want to jump to our epistle reading now, the last verse, that significant verse, 3 from 1 John. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself. Same kind of language. How can you purify yourself? You don't. Christ purifies you. Christ sanctifies you, sets you apart. How? Because yes, he inspires you, motivates you, puts his spirit in you to come to him, to his word, whereby you are sanctified. So yes, you sanctify yourself because you open a book, because you read, you hear the grace of God and his mercy for you and your life again, in which you put your hope the main distinction between faith and hope being hope is more of faith in that which is coming. In the knowledge that the day of resurrection is the perfect fulfillment of that which has taken place already by promise. Christ's death and resurrection being yours by water and word now directly, not just everyone's because it happened objectively 2,000 years ago, but yours objectively. Because that promise is now yours today. And yet we hope. We hope in a day when this comes to complete perfection, when he perfects what he has begun in you as well. The regeneration of your spirits and the renewal of your body, mind, and soul in the resurrection. And then, of course, we touch upon all our loved ones who have gone before us, those we rightly declare to be saints now passed away, who have died well in Christ. And we honor them. We honor them by coming to worship today and saying, I confess the same as them, and we follow in their train. What a thing to grasp hold of and take pride in, yes, even boast in Christ that we are equally members of the body, his body, which unites us makes us one. 
That's the meaning of sanctifies. For him, quite apart from the world. And wherever we are, as we discussed in the Bible study this morning, the kingdom of God is. Because he is our king wherever we are. We are his subjects. He is my Lord and God and king. Whether I'm here, though I will be brought here again and again to be strengthened in the faith and sanctified by word and sacrament out there as well as he is always my king in my heart. Which he is always strengthening and reminding me of my baptism every day. Every day we die and rise in the spirit for him. That is his promise. To daily die and rise. Though we do not enact the rite of baptism every day or more than once, shall we say. The promise is that daily we live in our baptism to die and rise in him. We just don't need to enact that baptismal rite constantly in order to remember that his promise is still attached to it once given. This wondrous mystery beyond comprehension but gives us peace without bounds. And so, yes, we come to our gospel text, that wonderful text which is used, I think, a few times a year in the lectionary in different contexts. Today, it's in the context of all saints. And how, yes, we are blessed to realize that without Christ in and of ourselves, our meager selves, our weak selves, our meek selves, our poor in spirit selves, we are blessed to be given the kingdom of God nonetheless, because it isn't about making a measurement of ourselves. Certainly not to our neighbor, because it's obvious enough that not to God can we make a measurement in his perfection, but that he imputes his perfection to us, declared by the sacrifice of his beloved son, the unblemished lamb. Poor in spirit, the kingdom of God is ours. That is, humble yourselves before the throne of heaven. Kneel as you're able. If you're not, take it as the right metaphor for our status before God. To come before him humbly. Because in light of him and his righteousness, we're nothing but that he imputes his righteousness to us and now sees us. Yes, even now, as perfect, get to the heart of the Beatitudes. Pure in heart are you. Blessed are you. You who will see God's face, you shall. You shall. Because Christ's heart is now yours. By faith. By trusting in this promise. It is in this which we have our hope for eternal life. How can I make a measurement and say, oh, I'm going to be good enough. Because I'll try my best. There is an irony there. When trying your best, you have to see you've missed the mark entirely. It has to be a bullseye. Picture it, the target. You've got the bullseye in the middle, you've got rings there. It doesn't matter if you miss by a mile or by an inch, you've missed it. And you are a pretty good marksman. But Christ hit the bullseye for you. He is the perfect one who lived for you. And so is the perfect sacrifice for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. That is justification before God. That is righteousness. Even a practical right righteousness, because the fruits of faith come from that declared imputation of righteousness.
Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. See this in the right way. It's not blessed are the merciful if... They conduct acts of mercy. Blessed are the merciful. For they see how merciful I am towards them, says Jesus. Why do you think you're merciful at all? Because you see the value in God's mercy for you. And it's that first and foremost principle of his mercy for you, for your salvation, 100% and absolutely for eternal life whereby you may actually produce a fruit of faith, a good work. Let's describe it as mercy. Love. Loving your neighbor as yourself, as is described in the second table of the law, because he loves you. Better reflection would be the first table. Should you come here and worship the Lord and giver of life, of mercy, of grace, of salvation for you today and always as the fruit of faith. You cannot but come and worship. He is your Lord and King. You are his subject. Praise God. Alleluia. Ah. Sons of God, verse 9. In our Beatitudes, Matthew 5. Linked in those phrases of seeing God, of mercy. He emphasizes peacemakers, which is interesting, as being sons of God. That is baptismal language, though. Where you declared a son of God by adoption into the royal kingly, godly household of God through those holy waters. You are declared a son of God. Guess why you're a peacemaker and blessed to be a peacemaker? Because the God of heaven and earth has now brought peace upon you and on your heart specifically. The war on sin being over because he has defeated sin, death, the devil, hell and the grave for you already. He has brought peace for now and for all eternity. So now you are blessed and being sanctified in him, able to be a peacemaker now between your brother or sister on earth, as it is in heaven, because the kingdom of heaven has come to earth. The kingdom of heaven, dear subject of the king of kings. I don't think there's a need to conclude with gospel. I think it's all been gospel, hasn't it? How do I sum up this sermon? But that the peace which surpasses our understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and forevermore. Amen.